Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Kat. So about a year ago, I interviewed my friend Tony, who is a medical science liaison in hematology, to talk about what is an MSL and how to land a job in this field if you're interested in this um, career path. So that interview really attracted a lot of attention. And many of you have told me that you found this interview to be really helpful, not only just to understand what is this job, but also how to actually perform well in interview and what are the tips and tricks in landing a job as MSL. So I thought it would be a great idea to invite another friend of mine today to talk about his career of landing into medical science liaison, specifically in neurology in this case, and give you a different um, perspective if you are interested in MSL. So without further ado, let's invite Mike. Hey, Mike. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Hi, Catherine. Doing great. I'm excited to be here. Uh, thanks for opening up your platform and giving me a voice to talk a little bit about my background and this whole thing about the medical science liaison career. This is awesome. Great. Yeah. I mean, I'm very excited about this interview. So maybe just to start off, um, could you please share with us about your current position and responsibilities? Yes. Yeah, sure. So I'm currently, I recently got a promotion, which, Ooh. you know, was totally unexpected, but I, I, right now I'm a senior medical science liaison at Biohaven Pharmaceuticals. So small company uh, focused on central nervous system disorders, uh, including migraine. And so, yeah, I totally was kind of blown away by getting a promotion earlier this year, which was a great way to start the year. But with great, um, with a promotion like that, you always have more responsibility. So uh, it's been a whole bunch of learning, but so far so good. Well, I have to say big congratulations to you. You know, surprise is always good. And, you know, I'm sure everybody has seen your great, um, uh, I mean, skill sets in the medical science field. That's why you get promoted. And I'm sure we'll do great on the new senior MSL role. Um, well, I mean, I think I have no idea what is the difference between a regular MSL and a senior MSL. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more? Um, what does the senior bring? So when you're a senior MSL, you get to run the entire company. The CEO steps down, you take over, uh, and you just start steering the company. I'm obviously just joking. Uh, with, with senior MSL, it, it's, it's kind of a nuanced sort of thing. So I guess the easiest way to explain it is you, you are in essence a peer leader. So as a regular MSL, you're still doing all the same functions, all the same tasks and responsibilities as a senior medical science liaison. The only difference is that within a team, you're looked at as a leader within the team. So, and some of the differences, some of the subtle differences are that when you're a senior, you'll actually be leading a lot more internal work streams. So you may be leading a work stream that's focused on clinical research, investigator sponsored research, scientific publications, all these different functions that are going on within medical affairs, you are going to have a bigger pull or a bigger leadership role on those. And while you're leading those work, work streams, you'll have MSLs from the team who are also working with you, but you're the sole person who's kind of steering, you know, that ship. Oh, that's cool. So it sounds like you're like the manager of the regular MSLs and you have people that report to you. It sounds very important. No, well, I want to definitely, definitely um, say that to clarify. So I don't have any direct reports, but it's, it's more like, on this one internal work stream. Let's just say the work stream is investigator sponsored research. So as the senior MSL, you may be the lead for that, but you have other MSLs that are helping you on that work stream. So they may be helping out with things like planning or um, coordinating projects or reviewing projects, but they're, they're not necessarily direct reporting to you. In that case, you still have a manager or a field director 
who mm-hmm. their sole responsibility among a million other things is to oversee and manage a group of MSLs. So Got it. It's a subtle difference. Basically just when I say senior MSL, just think of a peer leader. Somebody mm-hmm. the other MSLs can say, okay, this person has been around the block or they're, they're designated so that people can look up to them and say, okay, you know, ask for some insight and some advice. Yeah, sounds like a mentor potentially as well, maybe internal mentor. Got it. Great. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, right? Like, if you if you don't become a regular MSL, you cannot be a senior MSL. So I'm wondering, mm-hmm. what is your background, and how did you actually decide to get into the MSL field? Yeah. So for me, I'm a PhD biochemist. So I got my uh, PhD from Texas A&M University in 2017. And I don't know about you, Catherine, but once I was in my PhD, I knew pretty early on that I just did not like doing bench science. It was, it was completely at odds with my personality. It was like, it was like a dairy worker being lactose intolerant, (laughs) you know? So yeah, I'm stuck in there doing the experiments, but it was completely suffocating to me. So I, you know, just completely persevered through it. It wasn't really a fun time, but I always thought that there'd be a light at the end of the tunnel of my PhD. And thank goodness, I stumbled into finding out about the medical science liaison job. And when I found out about it, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that there was a role like this where companies will pay money. And I could, I can still remember kind of going through the job description when I first found out about it and just it was kind of surreal. It was like, it was almost like everything I've ever wanted was being written. And that's part of the job description. So once I found out about it, I pretty much, I made a very gutsy move and I was unemployed for six months. And I went full steam ahead on trying to get an MSL job. And how I did that was by networking. I knew very quickly that you always hear about the catch 22, right? Every one of these MSL jobs says you need prior MSL experience. So how on earth do you ever get that experience if nobody gives you the job? Mm -hmm. So I knew that to get around that catch 22 is I needed to learn the job better than or to the basically the, the greatest extent without ever actually doing the job. And the only way you can do that is by talking to people who are doing the job. Mm -hmm. So for six months, I networked, I learned about the MSL position, everything about it. I asked as much as I could learn from as many different people as possible. And fortunately, I got my first gig with Otsuka Pharmaceutical in 2018, which was a psychiatry role. Wow, that's exciting. But well, I have many, many questions with that simple few sentences, your introduction. So first of all, right, like, when did you hear about MSL? And how did you even hear about MSL? MSL at the very first place? I found out about it a a couple of months before my dissertation defense. So think about that. I've gone through about five years working in the biochemistry lab. And that whole time, I'm just, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I've always wanted to do something within education. So at first I thought professor was the track that was going to go. And then I quickly became disenchanted with the whole academic professor lifestyle. So I found out about it a couple of months before my dissertation defense. And I was just doing some late night soul searching on Google. You ever have any of those nights? Wow. Oh, always. Where you're just like, you're just dust in the wind. And that's a doctor philosophy. You know, you just keep searching. Yeah. 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 And I was looking up non-traditional roles with a PhD, you know, something that isn't quite mainstream, like mm-hmm. R&D or, you know, academic professor. And I found a blog. There was an MSL who wrote a blog about what the career was, what were some skills that are necessary, what they personally love about the career. And that was the first time I'd ever heard the expression medical science liaison. Mm. And from that day I was hooked. I was down the rabbit hole, as they say, just trying to learn as much about it as possible, reading the job descriptions, 
and then came to the realization, like I said before, that just because you read a job description does not mean you know what this job is about. You need to talk to people who are doing the job and interview them. And that's what I did for six months. Definitely, definitely. Totally agree with you on that. Um, before we move on to the informational interview um, that you've done for six months, um, what are potentially, let's say, three or couple qualities of MSL that really attract your attention that you think, oh, this is my job, like that is the job for me? So number one was when I found out that pre presenting scientific information was a crucial integral part of the, M the MSL role. When I found that out, I was like, yes, I loved presenting, loved it in grad school for all, for the exact magnitude of how much I hated doing bench research. The inverse of that was how much I loved presenting. Mm -hmm. So any career that had any type of scientific presentation as a part of it, boom, I was hooked. So that was number one. Number two was in biochemistry, you know, you're talking about a lot of pie in the sky mechanism, you know, this protein does this or it regulates this, who knows if there's ever going to be a direct relevance to a person's life based on all that time that you spent in the lab trying to figure that problem out or answer that question that nobody knew the answer to. So I was looking for a field where any type of information that I was exchanging, any education that I was providing, that it could actually benefit someone's life. And so it just so happened that in an MSL role, all the information that I'm disseminating could directly help a patient's life. And we can go into more detail on that later if you want, but based on the information that I'm exchanging with these doctors and these healthcare professionals, yeah, that information could prevent a side effect occurring in a patient, or it could at least trigger an awareness about what the clinician might want to be looking out for. And again, that could directly, you know, be the difference between a patient experiencing a horrible adverse side effect or, you know, not experiencing it. So that was probably a second one. The third one was, I talked a little bit about education earlier. I love education. I think education is always a two-way street. It's you're able to share some information to people who are hopefully receptive to it, but your audience should also be educating you. And I think people miss that with education. They think it's a one-way street. And so this job is you're at the interface between the science from a company and you're at the interface with the healthcare community who's using that science in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so there's a beautiful sort of two-way street that goes there between the two in terms of information that I'm sharing and information that I'm gleaning and learning from these folks, because let's be real, I've never treated a patient in my life. So that's where I can learn in this job. So those three things, I think, education, presenting, and uh, um, what was the last one? The last one was- uh, Learning yeah. from both sides. Learning from both sides. Yes. Yeah. Having a well, moment. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a, for that education piece, I think very similar to at least my healthcare consulting, because we also have to interview those KOLs in the specific disease area or diagnostic field. And we learn from them while at the same time, we will, will present them some target product profile. And then they will also see, say, oh, there's this technology out there that I've never heard of. So it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of parallels um, between both of our worlds. Yep, that, that, that's amazing. Um, so I'm wondering like in, among all these conversations that you've had, right? If you had to pick one in your last five years, um, four, um, four to five years experience in the MSL, what is really the most difficult um, conversation you had on the job? Oh, do I got a story for you? Oh, great. Uh, the, uh, this is, and it may surprise you and your audience, but the most difficult conversation I've had as an MSL had nothing to do with a doctor or a healthcare professional that I was talking to. Hmm. It actually had to do with a sales rep. Oh, so internally, so, and internally I'm asking too many questions. Sorry. 
You no, mentioned. no, no, no. I love it. Yes, absolutely internally. So this is when I was at my first company, Otsuka. And there, so kind of how it works is that in a pharmaceutical company, there's different departments, just like there is in any company or in any university, there's different departments. So in a pharmaceutical company, you have your medical department, you have clinical operations and clinical development, you have sales and commercial. These are all separate, discrete, you know, functions and departments within a company. But it just so happens that sometimes you as the MSL have to interact with these different departments. Typically, you do have to interact with sales reps. So you're interacting with somebody who also goes out into the field and their job is to promote a medication based on all information that's been FDA approved, something that's called on label. Mm -hmm. So as an MSL, you have to work with sales reps and you work with them in different capacities, depending on what the pharmaceutical company, what their standard operating procedure and what their protocols are. So every company is different with how that you interact with the sales rep. At my first company, um, my first company allowed you to interact with sales reps so that if say I didn't know Dr. Smith and Dr. Smith is a psychiatrist. Well, if the sales rep knows Dr. Smith, the sales rep can introduce me and say, Hey, Dr. Smith, this is Dr. Moore. He's our medical science liaison. He's our medical expert at the company. So any questions you have, he can handle those. And um, he can talk about them in a lot more depth than I can as a sales colleague. And boom, pretty straightforward, right? This opportunity that they can introduce you to people. So what happened on this one day is that this sales rep was taking me around to introduce me to a couple people, a couple of these doctors. And every time we had a call beforehand just to prepare and just to plan to make sure things would go smoothly. And on that call, uh, one of the things that we discussed was, well, whenever you introduce me, uh, please introduce me as Dr. Moore, and then I'll take it from there. And I'll, you know, talk about my background and introduce myself. So for all four of these meetings that the sales rep was taking me to, and after agreeing to handling things this way, when we actually were in the appointments, the sales rep would be like, hey, Dr. Smith, uh, I want to introduce you to my colleague. His name's Mike. You know, Mike is, you know, one of our science people and, you know, he can answer all your questions. And so... The, and this was for all four of these meetings that the sales rep sort of backtracked, went against what we agreed upon, and was introducing me in kind of a casual, perfunctory, you know, sort of way that wasn't very professional. And so after the fourth one, I approached the sales rep and I was like, hey, so, you know, thank you so much for introducing me to these people, but I've noticed that for each one of them, you didn't introduce me as Dr. Moore, you just introduced me as Mike, and you didn't really allow me a chance to introduce myself. Why is that? And the sales rep basically said, well, I don't, I don't feel comfortable because I'd be lying to the doctor. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean you'd be lying? And the sales rep is like, well, you're not actually a doctor. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, well, yeah, I'm not a medical doctor, but I have my PhD. So different kind of doctor and this sales rep. So basically I had to confront the sales rep because they, and I didn't want to do it in front of the, obviously the healthcare professional. So this was completely separate at a different venue. And so how I handled it is that I wanted to learn why this sales rep had an issue with it. So what I did was I asked the sales rep questions and I said, okay, so what, why aren't you comfortable introducing me? Why do you feel like you're lying to the doctor? And it's like, well, if I introduce you as doctor and they find out that you're not a medical doctor, then that, that, that assails my credibility and they could be upset with me because I'm the one who introduced you. And I said, okay, I'm like, I'm like, I understand that. So how about this? How about this is a compromise? Why don't you introduce me as Dr. Moore? And then because you're worried that you're going to mislead them, I'll pick up the conversation and I'll tell them and I'll clarify that, yes, I'm Dr. Michael Moore. Just wanted to let you know that 
I, I'm a PhD biochemist. So I did research for half a decade. So I've never treated a patient in my life. And that's a compromise that we agreed upon. And the next meeting that that sales rep had, I got to give it to her. She lived up to it. She didn't backpedal and she did it the way we agreed to and all was well. But that was in my first MSL job. And when I told my mentors, when I told my manager, when I told everybody who's way more seasoned and way more experienced within the career than I was, all of them, their jaws dropped to the floor. And they've never heard of a sales rep trying to like pull something like this. So I guess I just got lucky, you know, with this one monkey wrench in the organization who uh, wanted to, you know, kind of throw things off. But it was a really difficult conversation because I wasn't experienced, but I knew I had a legitimate uh, right to this. And so fortunately through figuring it out, talking about it, we were able to find a compromise and there was no more hiccups from that point. But that was a really difficult, you know, there's no reading a job description and, you know, knowing how you're supposed to address a situation like that. Wow. I mean, what a story. Uh, I, I feel like, yeah, that sells rap. Well, I hope all is well for him or her. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I'm glad you had this experience early, right? So potentially yeah. right, that prepared you for more challenging conversations down the line. Yeah. And I even remember in that conversation, like the, I remember the sales rep said, well, you know, I know nurses can be MSLs and they're not doctors. So I don't know what the big problem is. And I remember when she brought that up, I was like, that's, that's an interesting point, but there's one fatal flaw in that argument. You said nurses can be MSLs, but yes, nurses don't have a doctorate unless they're a doc, they're a DNP, a doctor of nurse practice. Um, and the one problem with your argument is that I have a doctor of philosophy. So your argument doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I remember in, whenever I brought that up, she, like she, she didn't really have a lot to go back on. So it was just kind of this own sort of, I think, stubborn, you know, resistant to change and kind of wanted to be the boss in the situation. But again, fortunately, we figured it out, we compromised and there was no issues from that day forth. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you figured it out. I mean, it's a fundamental logic flaw, right? Like, it's like, I like apple, apple is a fruit, but that doesn't mean I like all the fruits. It's like, the, the nurses can be MSL, but doctors can be MSL. That doesn't mean nurses are doctors. I mean, I don't see yeah. any problems there, you know, like, but I'm glad you figured out, but yeah, what a great story. I'm, I'm glad you shared that. So a lot of potential students and other working professional want to join MSL knowing that there's not only challenges talking to healthcare professional, but also internally, you know, a lot of difficult conversations would happen. They should prepare for that. <laughs> This is why relationship building and emotional intelligence is such a vital part of the job because mm -hmm. you are at a liaison between the external community and the internal workings of the pharmaceutical company. And within that internal, there's all these different people that you're going to have to be working with, with different personalities, different biases, different prejudices, whatever and whatnot. So you have to kind of be able to handle all these different situations. But again, you don't hear that a lot in a job description. Yeah, this is really, I mean, I thank you so much for sharing this. And well, this will be a segue. I mean, I'm also interested in, other than talking to sales reps. <laughs> you also mentioned different departments as well as doctors that you will have a conversation with. So what is really your day-to-day -day look like? Who else do you talk to? You know, can you maybe elaborate there? It's, yeah there there's really no typical day in this job i don't know if you feel the same as a healthcare consultant it's just all this different stuff that kind of gets dumped on you and you're kind of you're making it up as you go along um what it typically involves though are appointments so that's kind of the main thing is you're trying to get appointments and meetings where you're able to either virtually through a zoom meeting you know meet with this influential leader in healthcare that affects and impacts your company's disease state. So for example, you know, if, when I was in psychiatry, 
I was trying to meet with not every psychiatrist. I was trying to meet with the influential psychiatrists who were in my geography. So uh, you're trying to land appointments with them. And in those appointments, there's a lot of possibilities. Sometimes you're just trying to learn about their clinical practice um, and you're trying to figure out what they want, which that can be difficult. Sometimes, you know, sometimes when you're meeting with these people, sometimes they're the experts and there's nothing on earth that you could ever teach them. Even though they don't know anything about your company's data, they're the boss, they're the brainiacs, and there's no way that you're going to directly be able to educate them. So in those situations, you allow yourself to be educated and, you know, you defer to their clinical experience and their thoughts around psychiatry and how these medications are being used in with used in psychiatry. So sometimes they want to publish. Sometimes they may have a they may have clinical experience with your company's medication and they want to publish a case study. So that's something. Maybe they want to do research. So a big part of your job is trying to build relationships with key opinion leaders. And so that takes, you know, that manifests in these meetings. Could be virtual, could be me going to the hospital or to their outpatient clinic, or it could be that they meet me out at a dinner and we go to, you know, we go to Trulux and go to some steak or seafood house and we talk shop over dinner. Or maybe it's at a conference. I just got back from a neurology conference and met with a couple of these key people in my territory, you know, at this conference. So that's one big thing is building these relationships. I talked about internal work streams, depending on your company, some companies just want you to focus on external engagement that is landing these appointments. Other companies want you to get some exposure and they want your help on doing things internally within the company. So right now, for example, one of those internal work streams is new hire training. What happens if you're an MSL who gets hired to my company and you, you know, you're joining the team? What happens to you? How do we get you prepared so that you can start having these nuanced, you know, intellectual conversations with leaders in neurology? So one of my internal roles is I'm responsible for developing the curriculum for all new hires who are MSLs who join the company. They get trained on all the disease state information, all the product information, all of the sort of tech and operational sort of functions that you use within your day-to-day -day job, like booking, you know, travel through Concur. <laughs> How do you even do that? How do you do an expense report? So I, myself and another colleague are responsible for all the internal training for new hire MSLs. Just one example. Yeah, interesting. I mean, we do the same thing in consulting as well. When you're just on board, you have to go through the extensive training to get familiar with the company, internal like, expense reports, as well as external, you know, the healthcare landscape and everything on the knowledge basis. So yeah, yeah that, that, that's interesting. So actually, um, I have a follow-up question on the external relationship building piece, <laughs> because I always, maybe it's bias, I always thought, MSLs, you're trying to promote, quote, quote, right? The, the drug that your company is, um, I guess, building, developing. So you're trying to educate the doctors that potentially the benefit of this drug, the side effects, how it mitigates potentially the current drugs, um, things like that. So yeah. I did not know you guys will also talk about the clinical trial or case study publication, other things. Yes. And this is why. This is why it's so important to talk to as many different people in pharma, all these different MSLs as possible, because what's happening at pharmaceutical company X and what, if you interview an MSL there and say, what do you do? What's your day-to-day -day like at company X? Their answer is going to more than likely be very different than if you asked me at my company. Mm -hmm. So at my company, it's, and so the role is different and the role is different based on the disease state that you're in where the product where the product is in its life cycle you know has it just gotten fda approved has it been on the market for years is it about to you know is the patent about to lose exclusivity all these you know circumstances matter but 
yeah, as an MSL, it's, it's tough because you're just, you're, what your capabilities are, are a lot. There's a lot of different functions and tasks, responsibilities that you could be doing. So I used to have, I, if I was doing a presentation, I actually have a slide where it's like a visual schematic of all these different tasks. So one of them is research is always the easiest one, I think. So when you think about research, there's company sponsored research. The pharmaceutical company is investing more money than you can fathom on trying to get a drug to be clinically studied. So tested in humans to see if it works, whether it's safe, um, if there were any you know, tolerability issues. And so the company is paying a lot of money for these trials to be done. Sometimes you, as the MSL, are playing a role in making that happen. So in order to do a clinical trial, you need physical sites that exist right. that are recruiting patients, bringing them in, you know, screening them, making sure that the right ones are getting into the study and then, you know, managing all of that. So sometimes you as the MSL, sometimes to help make that happen is maybe you meet with somebody and they tell you that, oh, you know, I have a side gig where I actually have a research center and, you know, we're just starting clinical trials. Well, if they have a patient population that aligns with what your, what the study is that your company wants to do, because I'm the person who's meeting with this, you know, HCP, I now know that they have a clinical research, you know, company. They have a patient population that aligns with what we're looking at. So I can now bridge the gap between this person and all the clinical development and operations people. And I can connect them and then let them take it from there to decide whether they want to actually approve that, you know, healthcare professional as a clinical trial site. There's also investigator sponsored research. So you as a doctor may say, hey, you know, there, there's no data out there to show that your drug is good for, you know, anxiety. Mm -hmm. And it's not FDA approved for it, but I've been using it in my patients for anxiety and it's been working beautifully. So I wanna study your, I wanna do a research study on your drug and I want to focus on anxiety and show that it actually works. Oh, so interesting. So the liaison are helping out with all these things. And that's also goes into part of building the relationship. Like I said, when you're meeting with somebody, I'm trying to figure out what do they want? What fuels them? Sometimes research is the thing that fuels these people. They love mm -hmm. being a part of research and they have a research type mindset. So I get to kind of scratch that itch for them. And I get to ask them about this research idea and I, or I get to ask them about their research capabilities, if they have a company or if they're a PI and they've done other clinical trials. So I get to learn about all this and ask them questions. And then I yeah, get that to- That sounds a fantastic job. <laughs> it's really like relationship building um, and from every aspect um, surrounding the, the whole clinical, I guess, aspect of the drug development. So. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, other than pharma company that you mentioned, that of course having the MSL positions, how about other companies like um, diagnostic or medical devices? Yeah, yeah, there's MSL roles for all of those. Um, and because they're, in, they're not in pharmaceutical, the regulations are completely different. Mm -hmm. You know, the FDA is overseeing all the regulations for pharma because it's, it's a drug and it's a medication. But if you're at a medical device company or if you're at a diagnostic company, you know, there's a lot of these cutting edge companies or things like pharmacogenomics. Yeah, mm -hmm. they all have MSL roles because the technology or the device that they're using or the tests that they have, you know, all of these things involve science and all of these things, they're going to need people who can bridge the gap between the cutting edge science of the company and the clinicians who have to order those diagnostic tests or use that medical device. Mm -hmm. So all of those companies also have MSL roles. Got it. Well, that makes sense. Um, and I do have a couple questions that I actually gathered um, from my subscribers about MSL requirements specifically, if you can maybe just briefly um, explain that. So I think one is 
is a doctorate degree required for being in an MSL? Well, we talked about nurses, but what about, you know, if somebody only have a master's degree in healthcare in general, like, can they actually get into MSL? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think, I think when you look at the sort of the surveys that have been done about MSLs, the lion's share of MSLs are PharmDs or PhDs. And, you know, there's a whole kind of, you know, thought process behind that. Each one of those, the PharmD and the PhD have distinct sort of strengths that have come about from their education and from their background. That being said, there's also MSLs who are MDs or DOs. So they, they graduated from medical school, but they didn't want to go into clinical practice. Um, there's also a lot of master's degree MSLs. So there's advanced practice, you know, registered nurses or mm -hmm. um, nurse practitioners. There are uh, physician assistants who have master's, uh, master of science in physician assistant studies. So physician assistants are great in terms of a non-doctorate MSL. And so the way you kind of think about it is as an MSL, it's medical science liaison. So if you can leverage any one of those words, so if you can leverage the medical, that would be somebody who's a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, because even though they're not a technically a doctor, they still have a degree and hopefully they would have some clinical experience. Mm -hmm. So they would be, they have had experience often with treating the illness that aligns with what the company is developing a medicine for. So that's, mm -hmm. so if I was a, if I was a physician assistant and I had experience with treating patients with migraine, then I would be thinking about, you know, if I ever wanted to go to pharma, I'd be thinking, what are the companies that manufacture migraine medications? And I will be able to leverage my clinical experience treating these patients as a medical expert. Mm -hmm. PhDs, like we talked about, we don't ever treat a patient. We're never, you know, actually treating the patient and shepherding them along their therapeutic trajectory. So in that case, we are leveraging our scientific credibility. So that's what we're doing. Pharmacists, they can kind of do both. They can leverage the science because they know the pharmacology really well, but they also are typically in clinical settings. So they can leverage that as well. So you don't need a master. You don't need a doctorate. You can get into this with a master's degree. Um, just think about what is going to put you in the best position to get it. And so a lot of the times master's roles um, or master's degrees, you can leverage your real world clinical experience to get these jobs. Yep, totally. I agree with that. Um, it's either medical or science. <laughs> and yeah. finally, become the liaison between the two, potentially. Um, so how about a board certification? I've heard this several times, but I don't know if it is a requirement uh, to get into MSL. Yeah, so board certification, it's, to be honest with you, I don't know a ton I know that since I've been around, so I got into the pharma industry in 2018. I know during my time that there have been these programs that have come about um, that you can become board certified. What I can say is that no hiring manager I've ever talked to, no job description I've ever read requires that you need board certification to become an MSL. If that's the case, all my colleagues at my current company would be out of a job. All my previous colleagues at my other pharmaceutical companies wouldn't be there either. So it's, I think it's a new thing. I think it's, um, it's something that if you don't have any experience in the role, I think it's a way for you to learn about what medical affairs is within a pharmaceutical company and learn all this good background knowledge is. Uh, background knowledge to get you to a point that if you were to apply to a job, you could speak on it intelligently. But I already told you at the beginning of this, my way around that, because I didn't have a ton of money lying around to invest in one of these board certifications, which none of them are free, I think. Uh, I think they do cost money. Yeah. So I didn't have that luxury. So I had to do it the old fashioned way. I had to build my knowledge brick by brick by networking with MSLs. And like I said, it ended up working out because, you know, over that six months, I talked with enough of them where 
I could have a, a holistic, you know, sort of panoramic view of the career and how the role differed between companies so that when I got to the interview, you know, now it's game time. Now you have to convince people that you actually can do this job. And how on earth can you convince them that you can do the job if you don't know the job? That is the fundamental thing. That is why you need to build your knowledge about the role. And I did it through networking, but yeah, there's board certifications out there, but they're not necessary. Got it. Great. Um, one last piece just around this um, section is more if a person um, who has foreign healthcare backgrounds, but he or she does not have any working experience in the United States, mm -hmm. but they're currently in the States and really want to pursue MSL, what do you know can they leverage their foreign work experience um to apply or that's not applicable when us msl position i mean i don't have the experience to speak to on it but what i do have experience on is think about your individual case your individual story what makes you unique what makes you stand out um and if you have foreign professional experiences where you can make a case, you can make an argument that these experiences have informed you to a point that you learned about why you can do this MSL role. You know, if you were doing foreign clinical work overseas, or if you're doing research work overseas, um, if you were doing consultant work overseas, any of these things that involve, like we've talked about, building relationships where you've been a part of multidisciplinary, cross-functional, diverse teams of all these different backgrounds and you have come together. If you can talk about collaborative experiences like that, foreign or domestic, you can make a case for why you believe that this MSL role is right for you because you did that experience. And then you would have to talk about it and explain why that foreign experience makes a case for why you'd be good as an MSL. So anything collaborative, anything with education, anything with presenting, um, project management, you know, all these things where you're kind of overseeing a project, hit, trying to meet deadlines, working with people who are collaborating on that project, you know, steering the ship and leading the path, all of that is valuable. So. I wouldn't necessarily think about, don't think of it as like, oh, it's a foreign experience. Think of it as, is, the, is, is at the center core of that experience, is there something that is transferable to the MSL role? That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the golden nugget. And that's how you have to make your cases when you're in interviews. Yep, um, that makes sense. It's very similar to, I think, how you prepare for consulting um, interviews that, you know, if, let's say if you are always in a research lab, you don't really have working in consulting experiences. So you use your past experience, how you manage projects, how you collaborate with other researchers to demonstrate you are a good communicator, you're a good writer, you can tell a story, can, you know, talk to others. So those are the soft skills you want to demonstrate with your past experience. So. Totally yeah. see that there. But speak of interviews, right? So yeah. um, I'm just wondering how many, let's say, experience um, that you would have to prepare for MSL interviews? Is there a rule there or it depends on companies? Oh, so can you clarify the question, Catherine? Yeah. So I, I guess I'm just trying to relate to my consulting experience. So, okay. um, so let's say in consulting interviews, um, typically we will be asked a few questions, right? Like, can you please tell me an example where you worked in a team, right? Okay. And then you want to prepare for that question, for example, or, um, can you tell me a, uh, an example that you confronted somebody there, yeah, right? The, the, the example that you just presented was perfect <laughs> for that, right? And then how did you resolve that? So I'm just wondering, does this also apply to MSL interviews? Do you also have to, you know, think about your past experience and really tell a well-rounded story there? You got it. Yes. So even as you were saying those questions, I'm like, these are very similar questions that you would get in an MSL interview. Uh, what I found out is that they're called behavioral interview questions. Yeah. 
right? So yeah, tell, describe a situation when you had a disagreement with your manager. Describe a situation where you had to resolve a conflict with a collaborator. Yeah, mm -hmm. all these stories, these anecdotes. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of put, I think of these interview questions for MSLs that we're asking MSLs into three buckets. One are like your must have essential questions. These are things like, tell me about yourself. Why, why are you interested in transitioning to the MSL role? What do you know about the MSL role? Why are you interested in our company? These are like questions that you need to know the answers to. They need to be smooth, polished, captivating, and concise. So that's one bucket. Another bucket of questions are these behavioral questions that you're talking about, right? These mm -hmm. describe a situation when you had multiple projects with deadlines. Um, how did you go about it? You know, how did you work your way through it? The third bucket is one that I've discovered that, and I discovered it when I was interviewing, and then I've seen them come up more and more on interviews that I get to now be a part of and interview candidates um, are hypothetical questions. And these are the ones that are really difficult because if you've never been an MSL, if you haven't done your homework on the career and had conversations with other MSLs, these can be really hard to answer. Um, so like hypothetical questions like, you know, if you, so say, say you're the MSL and you're interacting with a KOL and they tell you they love your drug. They use it all the time. It works great. There's no side effects. And they tell you that in every meeting. And then you find out from in some way or another that they actually never write or they never prescribe your company's medication. So you find out through a reliable source that they're not actually using it. How would you react? So why would that require MSL experience? It's more like, how would you deal with a difficult situation? Yeah, I guess it's, I think it, I think it involves, if you don't have MSL experience, you've never had a situation where you've, you've known all these kind of intricacies about the role. So for example, is, is that KOL a big deal? You know, on the scheme of KOLs, are they the biggest person, most important person in your territory? Or are they a KOL, but on the scale of one to KOL, they're pretty small. They're, they're, mm -hmm. Their influence is more local. So if you don't know kind of these details about it, that these are all things that could help inform how you would react in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, why are they a KOL? Are they doing research for your company? Is it just because they're a promotional speaker? You know, there's a lot of different ways you can be classified in that role or as a KOL, but if you don't know these details, it makes it really difficult to answer that question. So yeah. And yeah. in that answer, in, if, you, if, if I was asked that, I'd have to explain some of those things. Like that's a really difficult question because there's a lot of things that I would need to know about the KOL. I would need to know about, you know, what is their relationship with the company? Are they a promotional speaker? Do they speak on behalf of our company's medication? Are they conducting research with our company? Are they publishing, you know, are they presenting on posters and publications that relate to our company's medication? Or, you know, or is it because maybe, is it because they're on the P&T committee of their local hospital? Mm -hmm. So why is that person a KOL? I would need to know that information. Um, what, also, yeah, who else do they talk to within the company? Are there other people that have a relationship with this person that I could check on and mm -hmm. hear their thoughts, get their opinions? Um, and then, yeah, it's just kind of getting a bigger perspective for a hypothetical. And then in that question, you can flex how much you know about the job because you've done your homework, you've talked to MSLs about these nuances, about what it's like to build a relationship. Well, this is interesting, actually. Um, I'm wondering, so is this a back and forth conversation? Let's say after you set all these questions, would the interviewer answer those and move on to like the next step? So if, let's say this is a very, uh, it's a KOL, a big deal, big name in the yeah. field, we have established uh, relationship with 
him or her, what would you say? Would would that be the next step or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, or, okay. Depends on the hiring manager, but yeah, it, a lot of times if it's like if you get these kind of questions, one, the fact that you didn't just say a response and say, oh, like I would, I would the next meeting I would go and like you know tell them or I'd confront them and say. You know, hey, if you don't, if you if you haven't used this, it's okay. You don't. I don't get paid because you've used the medication. The fact that, as a candidate, you'd be interested in learning more, asking more questions before reacting. That right there tells you a lot about a candidate. Mm. Got it. Got it. It's yeah. It's an open-ended hypothetical, and somebody who's experienced, who's done the job, would want to know these things. Somebody mm -hmm. who hasn't done the job may be impetuous and just say an answer just because they feel like they need to say an answer. Mm -hmm. So that can be a differentiating factor between somebody who has experience, who's done the job, and somebody who's brand new and is just hungry for their first opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I try to help a lot of candidates out that I mentor or then be prepared for hypothetical questions. About oh, this which is you do in this situation this is very interesting this is actually sorry since i'm a consultant so it's always always go back to consulting like so yeah. for consult interviews we have those behavioral questions plus your first must have questions we also say ask you know why consulting why our company right and yeah. then after the behavioral questions we have a case study right like we give you a, a hypothetical it's not hypothetical it's pretty much like our past case or um some case we spin it off so we'll actually give you the situation and then you have to solve this case so it's very similar to this right even yeah. i mean in your case it's hypothetical you have this problem what they're gonna do with it so it's it's very interesting it's very similar um across the field actually yeah yeah that's and it's an interesting thing because yeah they can be these hypotheticals are, are going to tell you a lot about the person they're a lot more mm -hmm. difficult to prepare for. Yeah. So you can catch people off guard and, you know, catch somebody who just, like I said, is, is rash and just says an answer without actually thinking about it first. That's somebody yeah. you do not want as an MSL because Definitely. when you're in that interface, the science clinical interface, you don't want to just be saying what's at the top of your head. Everything you, th you say and communicate should be well thought out and, be backed by something, not yep. just a knee-jerk reflex. Yep, totally agreed. Oh, so since we're talking about interviews, I'm just wondering any tips on the resources for candidates to prepare for interviews? Yeah, so resources. Um, what If you can, if you're interviewing at a company, the, the company's website is like a gold mine. It's just sitting there and hoping that you separate yourself out from every other person who's applying for it by reading that company website better than anyone else. And then be not even just learning the information from the company website, but being able to speak intelligently and organically about cool stuff that you had gleaned from reading about it. So company websites will always have what their, typically what their corporate values are, right? We believe in diversity. We believe in innovation. You know, to be honest with you, it's a lot of the same buzzwords, you know, but you can pick that up from the corporate website. You can also pick up information about their pipeline, which mm -hmm. as a, either a clinician who's coming into the MSO role or a scientist who's coming into the MSO role, you should be attracted to the pipeline like a moth to a flame. That should be something that's like, you should just gravitate to and be like, oh my goodness, I took a look at, why do I want to join your company? Well, I looked at your pipeline and I got to tell you, it's extraordinary. You're trying to target this receptor, which I know in that receptor, there hasn't been a lot. So this would be potentially first in class. Um, you'd be, you know, and you should be able to speak, you know, scientifically about what things intrigue you about it. So go to the company website and study that thing as much as you would study for your dissertation. It's like, you need to know it inside and out and be able to speak upon it. Mm -hmm. Tell a story as to why it's impactful to you or why it just has reinvigorated and reinforced why you wanna join this company and be a part of what they're doing. Read their press releases. 
if you want to, if you want a snapshot of what is most recently going on within the company, go to their press release. You know, maybe they just put out a press release saying that they just presented a record 20 posters at the American Psychiatric Association, APA. You know, and when you get on the call with the hiring manager, be like, you know, thanks for taking the time. You know, I just wanted to applaud you and the rest of the people at Company X because I just saw that y'all po- you or y'all presented 20 posters at APA. That's incredible. As you guys are pushing the boundaries. You're exploring all these cool areas of science and helping people with mental illness. You know, I just want to say congratulations. You're starting the interview off on a positive note and you're mm-hmm. subtly flexing that you do your homework. That's what they want to see. Because if you go to meet Dr. X, I'm sure it's the same thing when you go meet, you know, someone you're consulting with, you don't want to go into it completely dry and not know anything about them. It's you want to do your homework as much as you can to learn about them. So you can kind of think in your head, you know, I want to build a relationship with this person. So if I haven't done my research on Dr. Smith before I meet them, I'm a pretty subpar MSL. I should know that they went to University of Texas for their, you know, for med school, they did a residency, you know, at, you know, UTMB in Galveston, you know, and they, they uh, specialized in sleep medicine, you know, I should know all these things. And I should be able to speak upon those when I meet with them. It's the same exact thing that you should be doing in your interview. It's the same exact concept. Got it. Yeah, remember them as your, I don't know, those pop stars <laughs> yeah. and they are all their bios. Uh, yeah, great. I mean, I guess that, that kind of answered my next question that I had originally, you know, how do you prepare for a presentation if you ask last minute or maybe a short notice? So I guess if you're very familiar with the pipeline for that company, it probably will not be a difficult thing to do, right? I mean, the presentation is always a tough one because, and, you know, hopefully all y'all out there know that, you know, for these MSL roles, it is a, it's a core component to your interview process. You will not get the role unless you present. So typically companies will do the presentation at the, in the final stage, you've gone through a one-on-one interview with the manager, the hiring manager, your direct supervisor. You've either done a panel interview or separate one-on-one interviews with all these different people that are within the company, other MSLs, other people within medical affairs, sometimes commercial people that you'll be collaborating with um, across the aisle. Sometimes they'll interview you. But at the very tail end, if you've passed all of those and people like you, they see your potential, they think you could be a good fit, Typically, the last stage is the presentation. So sometimes companies will give you a slide deck to present on. Other times they'll say, you choose a topic. Mm -hmm. But it has to be a 15-minute presentation with 10 minutes of Q&A or a 30-minute presentation with 10 minutes of Q&A, whatever. It all differs. So how do you prepare for a presentation with short notice? It's tough because I'm a perfectionist. And I, I like being the most prepared for my presentations as possible. I like being so prepared that I make it look organic and natural. I, you know, I've gotten so many compliments on that. And the honest to God truth is that it looks that way because I've rehearsed that presentation more times than you can count. And I've gotten it to a point where I can make it look natural, real world, in my element, not artificial in any way. It's just very, I have it the way I want it. Kind of like a director of a movie. It's like, I have the vision for the presentation. I have the vision for the movie and I'm gonna shoot it the way that I want it. And I'm gonna present it the way I want it. If it's short notice, that's tough. Um, if, you, if you have any opportunity to talk to HR and say, hey, you know, is there any flexibility with the date on when I can present? You know, and they, you have to understand that you're, even though you don't have as much leverage in that situation, you do have a modicum of leverage because you've made it to the final stage if they're asking you to present. So they like you. 
they don't want to just let you go without giving you a shot. So I would ask the HR or the, the middle, the middle person who's coordinating this on behalf of the company, I'd ask them, is there any flexibility? You know, I have some priorities that I have to focus on with my job this week. Uh, it's not the best time. What about this week? So number one, do not be afraid to ask if you can have more time. Mm -hmm. And if they say, I'm sorry, you have to present, this is the only time that works for us, then at least you've tried. In that case, um, in that case, for me, if I have short notice, I, I need to, the, the way I think about it is what is the point of the presentation? What is the heart of the entire presentation? If I can figure out that, what is the core message? All this, all these PowerPoint slides, all this introduction, results, discussion, limitations, what is the whole point of this? What is the one message that I want somebody to walk away from this? That's if I can get to that, then everything else, I can, I can do a presentation on short notice if I know what the core message is. What is the takeaway? And because then once you know that, that is your central narrative that's going throughout all of the PowerPoint. All of it is supporting that central thesis, whatever it is, whether that thesis is we need to stop using antidepressants and we need to start opening our minds to, you know, antipsychotics, atypical antipsychotics for depression, or we need to stop, we need to start thinking, keep opening our minds to decreasing the number of medications that people are on. We need to reduce rates of polypharmacy. And with this medication, that's exactly what we have the opportunity to do. You don't have to be on multiple medications anymore. That's been the paradigm, but with innovation comes new opportunity. And that opportunity is to, we have a chance to take patients off of five medications to manage their you know, depression. And now we have an opportunity to lower that down to one. What is the core theme of the presentation? Figure that out and that's your, that's your heart and soul to your presentation. Everything else will make sense. Well, that's a great tip. I mean, ultimately, I mean, people listen to your presentation just want that key message, right? If you actually deliver that efficiently, even in your show notice, that really proven, you know, you did a really good job on that presentation. Yeah, yep. and that's, that's, that's the key. That's after, out of all the presentations I've done, I've kind of become a realist. I know that these people are busy. I know people's attention spans are, you know, like this now, thanks to all the <laughs> quick, you know, access TikTok. technology. <laughs> yeah, 15 second videos, <laughs> snippets. So I'm a realist. I'm like, they're not, they're not going to be able to pay. They're not going to be able to glean and remember every single detail I present on. So if you can think about the core message that runs through the entire presentation, if you're smart, everything you say will back up and bolster that central narrative. So it's not going to be the first time they've heard of it. You're going to be reinforcing it and setting the stage, you know, striking while the iron's hot on that core central narrative. And by the end of it, you will recap and summarize. This is, this is the exciting part of this whole talk. We have the opportunity to do something different. Um, yeah, and so this all is, that makes sense. Sorry. Uh, yep. Um, I, yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, that's a great tip, I think, for um, presentation just in general. Um, and I hope you know, everybody learned this lesson and you know, watched until this moment. Uh, and I have a final question uh, for you is um, what, I mean, we're trying to wrap it up. So what is your last tip um, for a candidate that are really trying to get into MSL? If you, if you're out there and you're listening to this and you've done your homework and you really feel like this job, the whole medical science liaison thing, if you feel like it's beckoning calling for you like a siren trying to lure you to come visit it if you feel that connection like i felt to this job then do not give up it's as simple as that it's 
gonna feel at times demoralizing. One of the things that is really, it's, it's a brutal truth to interviewing, no matter what industry you're in, but you can do everything right in an interview and you can still lose the job. At the end of the day, it's a heartbreaking realization. It's soul crushing to know that, but that is the game that you have in front of you. So if you feel like this MSL gig is for you, if you feel like, you know, yeah, I want to be, I want to be a part of cutting edge medical science. And I want to be responsible for educating and working and collaborating with the medical community that are outside of the pharmaceutical company. And I want to partner with them to advance medicine within a certain field or with a certain disease state. If that's you and you feel like you can do some good in this role, then don't give up. Keep learning. Keep networking. Do not stop networking. I remember when I got, uh, when I was in the thick of this and I was trying to get my first MSL role, I had interviewed with a contract MSL company and I made it to the final stage. And it was me and one other person. And I actually flew into Charlotte, North Carolina. I did my presentation. I did a panel interview and I know that I nailed that interview. And I know I nailed that presentation. And the head honcho from the contract company called me and even the hiring manager at the actual pharmaceutical company that I'd be working for. I spoke with both of them and they both told me that I nailed it. Everybody was impressed with me. There was not a single thing that I could do better, but we went with the other candidate. She was a pharmacist in... Charlotte, North Carolina, that's where the geography was going to be, was North Carolina and South Carolina. And as a, pharma, as a clinical pharmacist, she lived there, and she, she was actually involved in one of the biggest health systems that are within North Carolina. And at the end of the day, even though I couldn't have did anything better, they went with her because they, that was a very attractive quality, is... This person knows how these health systems work. She is able to get access to these health systems because she works there. So she has colleagues that she'll be able to get meetings with. And I don't blame them one bit for choosing her, but it did hurt. It was, it completely took all the wind out of my sails. And I was just like, I was low. I remember I was like so low. And my wife, you know, who's like the most amazing person, she knew I was just on my last legs. And so we didn't have a lot of money at the time because she was, she was in a temporary working situation because she's trying to wait to see if I get this MSL gig. So she can't do anything permanent. She used the rest of her money to take me out to get some Korean barbecue just oh. to cheer me up because I was crushed, Catherine. I was like, I studied so much I was able to talk about the company. I was able to present. I was able to ask their, answer their questions. And at the end of the day, it just wasn't good enough for that role. So that is my advice. If this is for you, if this is your dream job, if you are out there and everything I've talked about today just reinforces this in your mind that this is the exact career you need to pursue, do not give up on your dream. Keep networking. There's always more that you have to learn. I've been doing the job for four years and I am still learning about what it's like to be in a medical science liaison. And, I'm, and to be honest with you, I don't think I'm ever gonna stop. There's always gonna be something I can be learning to do better or just a different aspect of the job that I just, I have a sort of tenuous, you know, cursory understanding of what that entails. One example is all the healthcare economics stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Or all the insurance plan coverage. and this medication is a medical benefit and this medication is a pharmacy benefit. I don't understand any of that. So there's always more to learn. Keep networking. Don't give up on your dream. Find good mentors is another tip that I want to give all of you out there. Mentorship is the, it's something that if you've never experienced it before, me telling you about it, it's just not going to do it justice. But if you find a good mentor in your life, it is 
transformative. Catherine, do you have a good mentor in your world? Oh yeah, well, throughout my whole life, I have really good mentors. And I I mean, I really put my heart to appreciate them, to support me along the way. You know, I think I cannot be here without them, so. Yeah, someone you can be vulnerable bit with, you know, yeah, be open and honest with, and that they can be open and honest with you. If I did a presentation, you know, I'll, I won't reach out to everybody in my company and say, Hey, what did you think? I will reach out to a select, you know, group or a select person who I look at them and them and I have a mentor mentee relationship. And I will go to them and say, okay, brutal truth. What did you think of that presentation? I need to hear it. And I, and that's part of the whole mentor. For me, that's what I look for in a mentor. And I, I, I imagine with everybody, you're going to look for different things. Kind of like, you know, looking at a hiring manager, you may look at different qualities of what you think is a good manager. But for a mentor, I want somebody who's open and honest, somebody who I admire and respect, whether it's because they just do, they do some aspect of the job better than I've ever seen anybody do it, or they're, they're experts in an area that I am deficient in like pharmacoeconomic or managed care, all that nonsense that I just still don't understand. Maybe I look up to them because they have that expert knowledge. So that's who I lean on. And if you can find a mentor in your life, whether you're in grad school, whether you're in your first professional job or whether you're still a seasoned professional, you can always find good mentors and they're invaluable. So that's my last tip. Don't give up, stay networking and find a good mentor well great tips mike i mean i mean at least i really appreciate everything you shared with us today i think i learned tremendously even now you kind of convinced me if i should look into msl <laughs> but it's a, such sure. an attractive you know yeah it's a, it's a very attractive um job and um, i'm really happy you're happy on the job and you keep learning it's a great opportunity for everybody to you know, pursue um, and take a look at least. So, I mean, that's all my channel is for, right? Like to tell people those ex those those opportunities exist. You know, and like four years ago, Mike, you have to find a blog. So now you can watch a video interview with Mike and he can tell us everything about MSL to you. So this will be great, right? It's a great resource um, for an MS of somebody want to get into MSL. So. I would like to thank you again, Mike, you know, for taking the time and share all these great stories, great experience to my audience. And I, I mean, I'm sure everybody learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you times a million, Catherine, for having me on. And yeah, the full circle nature of life just never ceases to amaze me. It I really, that's why I love talking about this job because I hope that broadcasting about it through, you know, your YouTube channel or any of these other avenues, um, that somebody who has never, ever heard of this before will hear about it for the first time. And that's like, that's like my fantasy in my own mind that there's somebody. Oh, that's mine too. That's mine too. <laughs> that they're just, they're kind of, they just don't know what direction to take their life professionally. They know what they're good at, but they just don't know if there's something out there that fits that. And that's how I felt about finding this role was I knew what I was good at, but I just, it was just one of those things. You just don't know what you don't know. And I didn't know anything about the pharmaceutical industry and all these different, you know, roles. So yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to be on here. So that's all for Mike and Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. And I will see you in the next one.